All right. All right, welcome everyone to our very first day of uh, master's essay presentations. Um, my name is Celia Karp. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the department and I'm thrilled to have the honor of introducing um, several of our master's students who are now at the end of their program and are excited to share um, their research that they've been working on over the past few months. Um, so students will have about 10 minutes to present and we'll share, save five minutes for Q&A. Um, if you have questions um, that you'd like to share, please feel free to do that in the chat while students present. Um, if you'd prefer to come off and ask your question um, verbally, we can do that um, during the Q&A portion. Um, so without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. Our first presenter is Anne Rubel, who joins us um, with her Bachelor's of Arts in Anthropology from Emory University. And today, Anne will be presenting on her master's essay, a feasibility pilot of ecological momentary assessment EMA to oh there we go to understand microenvironments of sexual sexual violence risk on college campuses. So please take it away, Anne. You are you are still muted, Anne. Yes. Sorry. When you go into presenter mode, the like bar where you unmute disappears. Very inconvenient. <laughs> So I'm presenting on my essay, which, as Celia just said, is the feasibility pilot of ecological momentary assessment, or EMA, to understand microenvironments of sexual violence risk on college campuses. Okay. So we know that sexual violence is a public health issue on college campuses, with 13% of all students reporting an unwanted sexual experience before they graduate. There are some gender differences in this. 26.4% of female students and 6.8% of male students report an unwanted sexual experience before college campuses, but both of these numbers are still really high. There's also an elevated risk for transgender, gender questioning, and non-binary students. Experiencing sexual violence is associated with higher risks of depression and anxiety, and also continued academic consequences for the student, such as a lower GPA compared to their peers, or even dropping out of college. The Campus Violence Sexual Elimination Act, Sexual Violence Elimination Act, or the SAVE Act, has required universities be, to be transparent about these risks and implement response planning since 2013. So one way that universities have done this is through climate surveys. And so I feel like most people in the room know what they are, but basically they're surveys that are done once every year or once every two years. They're required by all federally funded institutions to do so. But these climate surveys do have some issues with underreporting construct definition. So for example, some people might not might consider what happened an unwanted sexual experience, but not consider it sexual assaults. And there are also lengthy reference points where these are done once every year, once every two years, they're done in May. And so there might be a lot of time that has passed between the event and the survey. So we're trying out this new method, ecological momentary assessment or EMA. So EMA basically is where a participant has a mobile device and they're sent a bunch of surveys throughout the day. And those surveys ask questions about their physical location, but then also like the activity that they're doing. So it adds ecological validity and also does something super unique, which is it measures risk across time, but then also environment and gives us real time data. Um, and so this method has not been used to evaluate sexual violence. So a feasibility pilot is super important to see would this even make sense to measure sexual violence risk? So the objectives in this feasibility pilot are feasibility, so is this possible? And that's measured through time to complete surveys and those completion rates. And then also, will participants be able to complete this, which is ass assessing the acceptability. And so that's looking at the participant experience and would they even complete the surveys if they were sent them? So we had three distinct college campuses chosen. We chose a public liberal arts college, an HBCU, and a private liberal arts college, trying to give like a, a representative sample of college students. The participant requirements were that they had to be 18 to 24 years old residential students, so they had to live on campus, and they also had to have access to a smartphone with a web browser so that they would be able to complete the surveys. For recruitment, they were recruited through flyers and newsletters on their campuses, and they completed a 10 minute informational Zoom call just to basically find out what the study was about, but then also to give them an overview of what we would expect for them to complete. So they completed a baseline survey, many place and event check-ins, and then an exit survey at the end 
and to encourage higher completion rates, we also had um, completion parameters that they would get like bonus compensation and a bonus gift card at the end for 80, 90, and 98%. We told them 100%, but if they missed just one, that was fine. So our baseline survey assessed demographics and the daily check-in was our event recording survey. It was sent at the same time every morning that a participant chose. Um, and it asked, did you have any unwanted sexual experiences since the last daily check-in? And so that's how we were assessing sexual violence risk. But then also the place check-ins were assessing the physical location and social context. And so they basically asked, where are you? Who are you with? And what are you doing? And they also asked questions about perceptions of safety, perceptions of risk and respect. And those were sent five times a day. And then at the end of the study, they were sent an exit survey, basically just being like, how was this experience? Was it easy? Was it hard? All of that. Um, and the questions were formulated and adapted from the Association of American Universities 2019 Campus Climate Survey, so that our measures were in line with other measures of sexual violence risk. So overall, there was an 88% survey completion rate, and the time to complete surveys was less than a minute for the daily check-in and less than two minutes for the place check-in. That was on average. Participants took, I think it was like three or four minutes to complete. But something that we really want to consider a lot in these EMA studies where participants are asked to complete six surveys a day is the burden on participants. And so seeing that it didn't take them too long to complete these check-ins was a really good sign that it wasn't a super high participation burden. And then from the completion, we can see that 60% of participants completed 100% of those event check-in surveys and that all participants completed at least 80%, which is really good. We also wanted to see kind of where are surveys being completed and who are they with. And so over 91% of surveys were completed when the participant had not had alcohol or drugs within the last hour. And 66% of those place check-ins were answered with a living and or sleeping space or dorm. So when we wanna look at the accessibility ac acceptability assessment and the limitations, for acceptability, we saw that 100% of participants indicated that completion was either easy or very easy, and 100% of participants thought it would be easy or very easy for their peers to complete surveys. So a big check mark in acceptability. The limitations, though, were, as we saw in the results, that 91% of surveys were answered when the participant had not had alcohol or drugs in their system or had not like, been around them. And then we worried that the 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. survey hours might not capture risk behaviors if they're engaging in riskier behaviors later in the night. The majority of surveys for the place check-in were also completed when participants are alone in their dorm. And so that does give us information, but when we're trying to evaluate microenvironments and sexual violence risk, we really want them to be answering surveys when they're around other people. So then to address these limitations, since this was the feasibility pilot in the future, we came up with some solutions. So one of the questions was, is the two-week period too short to capture relevant data? So to address that in the future, we decided to expand the study period from two weeks to three weeks. So there's a longer period of time, but then to keep in mind that participant burden and make sure that participants aren't doing too much or feeling overwhelmed, we reduced the days in the week that participants were answering surveys from all seven days to four random days out of the week. Then we also wanted to ask, are surveys being sent when participants are engaging in risk behaviors? So because the majority of participants answer surveys alone in their dorm, we decided um, that we wanted to send surveys up until 12 a.m. and then guarantee that two surveys are sent from 8 p.m. to 12 a.m. So it wasn't necessarily like a random assigned throughout the day now. Now participants were definitely going to receive two surveys in kind of the risk-taking hours. And then is this data relevant? So I feel like I'm really hammering on the participants who are answering this alone in their rooms. Um, and it was November when this was going on, so that could be part of it. But we decided to limit locations where participants are allowed to answer. And so now in the future, participants are not allowed to answer surveys if they're alone in their room, but they can tell us about um, something that they had, like a location they were earlier in the day. So we can try and keep capturing that relevant data. But we are really happy and like pleased with the high compliance rates. So that 88% survey completion and just that the majority of participants or all participants completed at least 80% is awesome. A lot of other surveys don't EMA studies don't have that high compliance rate. And then also the positive participant experiences is great because um, saying that they find it easy for them to complete, but then also their peers to complete shows that the questions were tailored correctly and that the acceptability was high. 
And then also the majority of college students own smartphones. And so in previous EMA studies where participants mayhaps had to like get a smartphone or be given a study phone, for this one, students were then able to integrate uh, the data collection into something that they already use all the time, which is their phone. And so overall, the conclusions from this were that this is a good way to collect data. With some adjustments, the data is relevant and that students are able to do this and this could work to assess sexual violence risk. I want to acknowledge Dr. Decker, Hate, James, the HSM team, my family and friends and the grant, um, but that's it. So thank you so much. Great work. Thank you so much, Anne. That was wonderful. Round of applause for you. All right, um, I see lots of applause coming in. Uh, okay, so I was just checking the chat to see if we have any questions there. Um, I'm not seeing any so far, um, but if anyone has a question that they would like to ask um, and directly, you're more than welcome to um, raise your hand and I can call on you to unmute. Yeah, go ahead, Mega. Hi, um, I just wanna congratulate Anne and that's some really great data. Um, I had a question. So I know you uh, mentioned that there was a really high compliance rate, but uh, for future studies, if participants are not answering surveys every day, uh, will that impact the validity of the data? And if so, how? Yeah, so since the EMA is intended to be kind of a slice of life, uh, we, in like future studies, broke it up so that they're not answering surveys every single day. But those days that they're randomly assigned, we're hoping that the data is still like relevant and correct, because even if it's not like a straight 14 days, it's still over a 21 day period. And we think that will still be super relevant because people in their day to day are not changing everything. And like, if you're a college student, you do have pretty certain routines. So even if they're not asked every single Tuesday, we're hoping that like the sample is still representative. Mega. Thank you. Yeah, and I see another question came in the chat. David, did you wanna ask that? Um, uh, yes, actually, that uh, um, message got away from me. Uh, so thank you. Um, a great, uh, great talk. Very interesting. And uh, I haven't read very much on the subject. Um, if you're dropping from seven to four days, um, are there specific days that are, are uh, uh, higher risk for violence? And if so, if you have that data, can you uh, specify the days of the week consistent with that data? And there may be other uh, uh, demographic differences that may influence how you choose the days you will look at. Yeah, so um, for this, the feasibility pilot, we weren't looking at necessarily the data that was like collected. So the risk of violence, or even since it was like such a small, it was only 15 participants and we were just trying to see the feasibility and acceptability. But for the next survey, um, I think that would be better to actually answer those questions for the data that we want to know. But this was looking at the mechanics and um, like participant experience to be able to collect that kind of data in the future with a larger pilot or with a larger study. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Anne. Um, Azim, did you want to come off mute? Yeah, um, great presentation, and I just wanted to ask, so what surprised you most about the pilot study? I think the high compliance rates surprised me the most, just because in other EMA surveys um, and other studies, you'll see people really excited that they had like 70 or 75 percent, and the fact that we had a bunch of participants who completed 100 percent and a ton who completed like 90 percent was really surprising, um, and then I also thought that like college students might be less likely to fill out surveys just because they're so busy um and like they're just like well i don't want to say like they're irresponsible you also just don't know if people like what people are going to do but the super high uh completion rates were definitely super surprising and a, a good surprise but super surprising great any last questions before we wrap up All right, well, wonderful job, Anne. Thanks for kicking us off with such a wonderful presentation on a really important topic. All right, we are going to now um, switch over to our second presenter, Padmini Balaji, who also joins us um, from Johns Hopkins University where she uh, earned her Bachelor of Arts in Public Health. Um, and Padmini will be presenting on her master's essay titled A Scoping Review of the Implementation 
of technological interventions addressing gender-based violence. Handing it over to you, Padmini. Thanks, Celia. Um, so yeah, uh, like Celia mentioned, I'll be presenting on a scoping review of technological, or sorry, of the implementation of technological interventions addressing gender-based violence, and also the lessons learned from the pilot implementation of a web-based safety planning tool for women experiencing intimate partner violence in Nairobi. So just to start us off, I would like to first thank the um, my essay readers, Dr. Michelle Decker and Dr. Shannon Wood. Um, I've had the privilege of working with them for about three years now, and they've just been really tremendous sources of support and mentorship throughout. Um, I also want to acknowledge the My Plan Kenya implementation team over at our partner organization called Ujama in Nairobi. Um, I had the pleasure of working with them over the last year and just learned so much from this team um, and also uh, Bianca Devoto, the research coordinator for this project. Um, and then I also want to acknowledge the R1 grant that funded this study. So um, to start us off with some background, um, I will provide some definitions first. So intimate partner violence or IPV refers to any behavior within an intimate relationship that causes physical, psychological, or sexual harm to those in the relationship. And it's a global issue experienced by one in three women in the world. Um, Gender-based violence or GBV is more of an umbrella term that can take on many forms, including IPV. Um, and with the high burden of IPV and GBV worldwide, it's necessary to implement interventions to better meet the needs of survivors. Um, but of course, there's many challenges related to doing this, especially in low and middle income settings. Um, so some of those include inequitable sociocultural norms, limited knowledge about um, IPV and GBV among service providers, limited training on awareness and prevention skills around implementation, and deficient policy guidelines. So we really need to um, improve GBV response and linkage to services to better meet the needs of survivors. Um, there's been some digital technologies emerging to address some of these challenges, and they can be grouped into the broad umbrella of e-health. Um, e-health is the cost-effective and secure uh, use of information and communication technologies in support of health. And so there's many e-health interventions that have emerged to address GBV, um, and they've a lot of them have been shown to be highly feasible and acceptable, and then there's also some positive evidence around effectiveness. So My Plan Kenya is an example of one such e-health intervention developed to address GBV. And My Plan is a safety decision aid for women experiencing IPV. It's been imp implemented in many settings, but was adapted specifically to the Kenyan setting using key informant interviews and focus groups. Um, after this adaptation process, it was established as effective in an RCT done in informal settlements in Nairobi in 2018, and the RCT found that My Plan Kenya increased women's use of safety strategies, it increased their resilience, and it also reduced violence in the most severely violent relationships. So based on these results, we are implementing My Plan across health, justice, and community-based organizations in Nairobi, and we're also studying this implementation process using implementation science research. So implementation science is a relatively new field, and it's designed to enhance the uptake of evidence-based interventions by addressing contextual barriers and facilitators to uptake. Um, ensuring that an intervention is acceptable, feasible, and effective isn't enough without knowing how to make sure that it actually reaches the audience that it's meant for. So implementation science is really that additional step needed to ensure that the intervention eventually has impact. Um, there's been previous reviews done on the implementation of e-health interventions broadly, um, as well as in low and middle income settings, but they're not GBV or IPV specific. So that brings me to the aims of this master's essay and project, which was firstly to conduct a scoping review of factors influencing implementation of e-health interventions addressing GBV, and then develop a framework with these factors to guide future implementation. Um, and then aim number two was to apply this framework to My Plan Kenya implementation and expand on the framework based on case observations. So I won't go too in depth into the methods um, to kind of save on time, but basically we did some initial searches to hone into a topic, then conducted some more rigorous iterative searches in PubMed to identify articles, then narrowed down these articles to what was relevant and extracted data from them, and ultimately constructed a framework based on these results and expanded on it using My Plan Kenya implementation. Um, so about a thousand titles and abstracts were screened, um, or sorry, were screened after duplicates were removed during the um, scoping review, and 114 full text studies were then assessed for eligibility. 
Most of the studies were excluded because there was no discussion around um, implementation, which again kind of just shows how essential this um, steps in, in implementation science is. And then, oh, sorry. Ultimately, 11 studies were included. Um, two were about the same intervention. So 10 interventions total were looked at. So just an overview of the results, most interventions were implemented in the US or in other high income settings, and only two were implemented in other settings, which were Kenya and Botswana. Um, intervention targets included many different kinds of GBV. Um, most of the tools implemented were some sort of technology assisted screening for violence, and most interventions were implemented in medical settings by healthcare professionals for their patients. So this is the uh, framework that was ultimately developed. Um, as you can see, there's four different levels to it. So the infrastructure organization, organization beneficiary dyad, and beneficiary levels. Um, and then factors were also organized into um, the two different components of the Venn diagram, which were eHealth and GBV. So now we can take a closer look at each level and just talk about a couple of examples of factors in each. Um, so at the infrastructure level, stakeholder and political support was very important in multiple settings. So for example, from the literature, um, one intervention needed approval from the Ministry of Education to then be implemented in schools. And likewise, My Plan Kenya needed approval from the Ministry of Health to be implemented in health facilities. Um, and then on the GBV side, enabling environment was something that was added um, based on My Plan Kenya implementation. And this was because social norms around IPV in this setting really influenced how people viewed this intervention in general. Um, then at the organization level, um, fit into organization structure and workflow was an important component on the e-health side. Um, in the literature, it was a facilitator for five interventions and a barrier for two, and it influenced implementation in many different settings, including home visitation programs, schools, family planning clinics, and hospitals. Um, then on the GBV side, preparation for GBV discussion was also important. So for example, providers reported being more reluctant to use screening tools if they were unsure about how to handle a positive screen. And then this was the case for My Plan Kenya implementation as well. So for example, there was one organization which didn't want to implement My Plan because they felt unprepared on how to respond to clients' questions about GBV. So next at the organization beneficiary dyad level, refer stigma was something that had a big impact. So in one of the studies, providers were found to be more likely to use the e-health tool with patients of certain races or who were presenting with certain problems, um, which shows that they might have carried some stigmas related to GBV, which affected their implementation. And then similarly, um, My Plan Kenya has been implemented among many audiences, and some have been more reluctant to implement it due to kind of stigmatizing beliefs around IPV. Um, at the beneficiary level, access to data and technology was often a huge barrier. So for six out of 10 of the interventions in the literature, um, this was an issue and several orgs implementing my plan um, bring this up as kind of a potential cha challenge too, um, especially in informal settlements because um, women in these settings often can't afford smartphones or data and sometimes their devices are shared with their partner. So that kind of ties into the privacy aspect of this as well. Um, so leading into some recommendations based on this framework on the e-health side, um, something that really needs to be prioritized is minimizing the technology barriers um, because limits to technology really limit the impact and scale of interventions um, that are e-health related. So on a policy level, that means increasing funding for organizations um, to use technology um, in you know, health facilities, but also justice facilities and community-based organizations. And then organizations themselves can also invest in devices that are available for public use and in ICT training for their clients so that um, their clients can access e-health tools more easily. And then aside from tech barriers, we can also minimize workflow barriers by strategizing with organizations on how to fit these tools into their existing workflows and by framing e-health as something that will really ease their work burden rather than adding to it. And then on the GBV side, there's oh, sorry, there's a need to um, support organizations in their preparation for GBV related discussion. So the World Health Organization recommends a training called Listen, Inquire, Validate, Enhance Safety and Support, or also known as LIVES. And this is a training for healthcare providers specifically, um, but there's also sessions that can be tailored to any organization to improve their readiness to meet survivors' care needs. 
Um, so overall, policy and programming really should integrate um, all these kinds of barriers and facilitators into their work and just address um, these at all levels that influence implementation in order to ensure that e-health can have an impact in addressing GBV. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Padmini. That was a really great presentation. Um, all right, I'm just pulling up the chat here to see if we have any questions. Lots of applause from the audience. All right. All right, does anyone have any um, burning questions for Padmini to get kick us off? Yeah, go ahead, Khadija. Oh. Hi, um, first just wanted to say that was a very visually appealing presentation, so congratulations. Um, and maybe give you a suggestion that I think maybe you should submit it to the IGWG because I think there's been a lot of discussion around scale up and I think that graphic that splits the the GBV and the other like I, I think the way you laid out the infrastructure organization dyad um, factors is really interesting and I think could be useful to other organizations. Um, when it comes to thinking about the like systematically right that in the global south that women have lower access to um, technology, they have lower access to cell phones. I'm wondering what work or what if you noticed anything innovative in terms of incre increasing women's access in the scoping review. And um, given that you've, it sounds like you've been doing some work with my plan as well, whether there's anything that you've noticed within the, the intervention that you think could be added as a recommendation to ensure that there's equity and access when, um, when thinking about these kinds of interventions. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you so much for that suggestion and for the question. Um, yeah, definitely there are there is a big divide in kind of digital access um, related to, you know, um, the region of use. So in high income settings, just technology infrastructure is a lot more widespread. And that's something that um, based on the literature was very clear that um, it was a lot easier to implement these kinds of tools in those settings. Um, but that being said, I think, like you said, there are kinds of innovative um, things that we can do to address that. Um, so a lot of interventions, I think, in kind of uh, more low and middle income settings will um, be kind of accessible in different ways. So my plan, for example, is not only um, um, accessible on a mobile device, but also on a computer or a tablet or other kinds of devices that maybe can be more publicly accessible rather than um, just personal devices. Um, so in that line, I think organizations can kind of do the work to also make these kinds of publicly accessible devices available for women to use um, in these settings. Um, I think there's also other interventions that have kind of um, really acknowledge that even smartphone use is not super widespread. So there's kind of USSD codes that um, kind of can boil down interventions into like a um, USSD code so that people can access it even if they don't have a smartphone, but if they have another kind of phone. So I think there's all different kinds of innovative ways to make things more accessible. Um, but I think at large, it really comes from um, making that infrastructure then more accessible. So I think just the broad recommendation is to um, improve funding for technology use in these kinds of settings. Great, thank you, Padmini. Do we have any other questions in the audience? All right. If questions come up, please um, feel free to add them to the chat and Padmini, maybe you can answer them there while you're available. Um, but great to have the two um, violence related presentations back to back to kick us off. Um, all right, we will hand it over to our third presenter. Um, next up, we have Emma Fernandez and Emma joined us from Florida State University where she earned her bachelor's of science in family and child sciences. Um, today, Emma is presenting on her master's essay, which is entitled Health Professional PAC Campaign Contributions to Members of the U.S. House of Representatives, Exploring Voting Patterns on Abortion and Contraceptive Bills. All right, Emma, go ahead and share your slides and kick it off. Thank you. Is it showing up? I think it looks good. Uh, yes, I will. I'll let you know if it doesn't progress. 
Okay. Go ahead. Um, so hello, my name is Emma, and today I'll be presenting um, my master's essay, which is Health Professional uh, PAC Campaign Contributions to Members of the U.S. House of Representatives, Voting Patterns on Abortion and Contraceptive Bills. Uh, so to start off, I'll go over some of the topics covered to provide a background for the paper. The Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization is a Supreme Court ruling that took place in June 2022, and it removed constitutional protections for abortions. This decision effectively overturned Roe v. Wade and allows for states to institute their own abortion policy, which can either restrict or expand abortion access. Political action committees are political committee uh, organizations for the, that are used for the purpose of raising and uh, spending money uh, to elect and defeat candidates. The term affiliated organizations is used to reference the health professional organizations uh, that is related to each PAC. So for example, the American Medical Association is its own organization and it has a PAC that represents its interest. Uh, in the paper, the three bills and all of the donation data were taken from the 117th Congress, which took place in 2021 to 2022. And finally, uh, all of the bills are related to expanding or protecting abortion or contraceptive access. The first bill uh, that this study examined was H.R. 8296, which is the Women's Health Protection Act of 2022, and it aims to protect abortion access and providers' rights to administer abortion care. It protects providers from giving out medically inaccurate information, and it protects against barriers to administering abortion services. The next bill, H.R. 8297, Ensuring Access to Abortion Act of 2022, protects women and providers who are seeking or administering abortion care out of state. This bill addresses the legislative threats that abortion restricting states use to prosecute pregnant people who need to travel out of their state to access abortion care. And the final bill is H.R. 8373, the Right to Contraception Act, which protects individuals and providers' rights to provide and have access to contraceptives and accurate health information. The objective of the study is to determine the con if the contributions of the 20 healthcare PACs align with the stances their affiliated organizations have taken in support of um, access to abortion and uh, contraceptive con contraception. So the um, analysis took place in five steps, and the first one is that the 20 PACs were selected based off of uh, statements following the Dobbs decision, and to be included, each statement had to mention uh, the Dobbs decision and take a stance against it. But to select the PACs that were used in the paper, the website Open Secrets was used, and the health professional PACs were listed in descending order of donation amount, and the top 20 PACs whose affiliated organizations released a statement were used. Second, the total contributions made by each of the 20 PACs to members of the House of Representatives that voted on each bill were recorded from the Open Secrets website. And third, the contributions of each PAC to members voting in support and against each bill were determined in aggregate and then averaged over the total number of voting members. Uh, fourth, the percentage of total contributions made by each PAC to members who voted in support of the bills was calculated, and these were compared to a 66% benchmark that represents the PACs that contributed twice as much to members um, in support of the legislation. And finally, the average size contribution to each PAC to members who voted in support or against each bill was calculated. And this final calculation was limited just to those members who received a contribution. So due to time constraints, the results uh, section will only cover three of the five findings, and the next three slides are formatted with the results for each bill being listed um, under the bill name. So the first finding is the total contribution made by the PACs for each bill. Um, the total amount of funds contributed to members of the House of Representatives is listed in the circle titled total, and in the circles underneath the average contributions to each voting member of the House was found for members who voted against uh, or in support of each bill. So overall, PACs gave higher contributions to members who voted in support of the bills. However, as you can see, uh, 
the amount contributed to members who voted against the legislation were still substantial. The second finding um, looked at what percentage of total contributions went to members who supported, uh, who voted in support of the legislation. And so the red line, which is in bold and runs horizontally um, along each bar graph, represents the 66% benchmark set to assess how many PACs donated the majority of their funds to members who voted in support of the bills. Less than 40% of the PACs donated more than two thirds of their total contributions to members who voted for each of these bills. This means that the majority of PACs donated less than $2 for every $1 that they gave to members who opposed these bills. Um, this analysis was used to assess PACs alignment um, with their affiliated organization statement on the Dobbs decision. And the final finding looked at the average size contribution to members of the US House of Representatives who uh, received a donation. For each bill, the numbers listed, which are 12, 11, and 14 respectively, are the number of PACs that on average donated more per member who opposed the legislation and who received a contribution. This shows that the majority of PACs gave a greater size contribution to members who voted against each bill. So based off of the results, this study um, asked three questions to better assess the relationship between PAC contributions and affiliated organizations' uh, stances on legislation. The first is, are these organization statements aligned with their PAC contribution patterns? In other words, are these organizations putting their money where their mouth is, with PAC donations being reflective of the positions their organizations took on abortion and contraceptive care? And while there were differences in contributions to supporting and opposing members, the differences did not match the severity of the issue that these organizations emphasized in their statement. The second question, uh, is it fair to assess the alignment of PAC contributions with organizational positions? And so alignment between PACs and their affiliated organizations can provide a greater means to support policymakers and push for policy that is representative of the foundational principles of these PACs of these healthcare organizations. Being cohesive and consistent in statements, policy agendas, and donation patterns can amplify and focus impact. And while PACs and their affiliated organizations may be separate legal entities, they represent similar goals and purposes, both to members and the general public. The final question was, what is the importance of uh, transparency? And so for reference, there's little information on the donation goals and objectives of the affiliated PACs on the healthcare organization's websites. All of the data on political contributions made by these PACs was found on a third party website, Open Secrets. And while the statements reflected the outrage, disappointment, opposition to the Dobbs decision, there was no clear statement of action and no mention of if PACs would cease, reduce, or change donations to members of Congress who voted against key pieces of legislation. This study had four main limitations, the first being that PACs donated to politicians for reasons besides their stances on the reproductive health bills. And the donation data gave overall totals of how much was donated to members of the House, and because of this, we were unable to understand why the money was donated and whether the position um, on the health bills was a major factor. The second is that other donations were not examined. And as a result, we were not able to distinguish um, if a legislator in total received more contributions from PACs supporting rather than opposing the abortion rights. Third, the study does not show causation between donations and voting patterns. Uh, the analysis simply aimed to assess if health professional PACs donated more, less, or the same amount of money to members of the House uh, who voted on reproductive health bills that aligned with the stances their affiliated organizations took uh, on the Dobbs decision. And finally, the statements were not released by the PACs themselves. Uh, the organizations and PACs, as I mentioned before, are separate legal entities, and this might explain some of the uh, apparent lack of alignment. Um, it is the a recommendation of this paper that healthcare organizations routinely disclose their contribution data matched to position statements so that organization members can determine whether these statements alone 
without commitments um, on contributions are sufficient. And also that more research be done to understand the significance of higher donation um, to donations to members of the House that receive funds and vote against bills that are of important to the organization. And finally, I wanted to say thank you to my reader, uh, Dr. Sharfstein, who helped me so much in planning, organizing, and writing this paper. And thank you to the Popham Department and everybody who came to the presentation. Wonderful job. Thank you so much, Emma. All right. Uh, great work. I see some applause coming in um, and a really interesting topic. Um, all right, I will open it up for Q&A if anyone has any questions they'd like to ask. I guess while questions come in, Emma, maybe I'm just curious about how you um, ended up landing on this specific um, topic. Um, and that's just kind of from knowing you and some of the other work that you've done, how did you um, end up landing in this space of looking at PAC contributions? Oh, well, so I work um, with Dr. Sharfstein on a project very similar to this one, looking at um, basically the PAC contributions, but to bills related to racial equity. And mm. um, uh, so, so through that, that uh, research position that I, I kind of made this uh, presentation and project. Uh, the only difference is that I used bills related to abortion and contraceptive uh, care. Yeah, great extension of that work. All right, I see David has his hand up. David, do you want to go ahead? And then could he yes, uh, thank you. Great presentation, very interesting. What about the um, uh, uh, contributions that were made prior to Dobbs? Do you have any sense of how Dobbs shifted the patterns uh, with respect to uh, abortion and contraception uh, before and after? Um, so we didn't look at the um, any uh, donations, I guess, before this session. And so, yes. mm -hmm. um, so for the 117th Congress, part of that did take place before the Dobbs decision. And so there was no um, way to know the difference in donations that took place before and after. Um, just because there weren't any dates listed on the donation data um, on open secrets and um, we also didn't look at um, the like the any data from the 116th congress i i see i see um uh i thought dobbs took place um uh, 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 during this session mm -hmm. it, uh, yes it, it took place during the 117th yes um oh. uh, there, there was no um antecedent data uh, with respect to uh, 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 support, um, PAC support for various Congress people? Um, so, well, just when it's listed, um, none of the, the contrib like, so contributions that took place in the beginning of the 117th aren't, like, there's no differentiation between if they took place after or before. I see. Um, mm -hmm. Just between, like, 2021 and 2022, they're all listed, so. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great job. All right. Uh, thanks, Emma uh, and David, for that question. Khadija, did you want to ask a question? Sure. So given that it sounds, I mean, your main conclusion, right, is that the PACs are not putting their money where their statements are when it comes to reproductive health and, and to DAP. So I'm wondering what you would like to see done to hold them accountable. I know that you made a recommendation about releasing more data, but when it comes to generating action and, and pushing them to actually change how they're donating and, and make sure that that's in alignment, what would what would you like to see done? And is there any additional research or information you think you need maybe before, like putting forth an advocacy statement or something like that? Yeah, I I think um, I guess what I would like to see done is is ideally that that there's more alignment between the PACs and the affiliate organizations, and so um just because the, the two are related so I, I think if if when PACs release statements on issues that are important to them um that they also included their plans for if they were going to change contribution patterns or go 
uh, the American Association for like OBGYNs. It's this is a key uh, decision for them, and and it really impacts like how uh, they're going to practice in the future. And so I think if how they planned on using their PAC to further their agendas was stated, um, I, I think it could keep them more accountable and hopefully generate more action in um, you know, through the, the donation power, um, I, I guess, that the PACs have. And, um, overall, I think that it, it comes down to also if members keep their organization accountable. So I, I think though with, with statements related to like how they're gonna donate in the future or um, you know, what who or which uh, members they will donate to, I, I think that that accountability between members and the organization and then that's representatives will hopefully make a difference. Thank you, Emma. And thanks for the questions from the audience. All right, just to keep us moving along, keep us on time. Um, we're going to shift to our next presenter, um, and both of our next presentations um, take place, I believe, from work in Yemen. So our next presenter um, joining us is Huda Tassif. Um, Huda joined us here at Johns Hopkins, coming from um, UNC Chapel Hill, where she earned her Bachelor of Arts in Public Policy. And Huda will be presenting on her master's essay called Conflict and Consent, Factors associated with marriage decision making for adolescent girls in Yemen's humanitarian crisis. Take it away, Huda. Thank you. Okay, let me share my screen. Looks good. Okay. Perfect. Thank you all for being here. I know it's hard to sit through a bunch of presentations, but I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so my um, presentation is called Consent and Conflict, Factors Associated with Marriage Decision-Making for Adolescent Girls in Conflict-Affected Settings in Yemen. Um, and my reader has been Dr. Zimmerman. So to first go into a little bit of background, um, even though rates of child marriage are declining globally, um, one in five girls will be married before the age of 18. And a, an additional 150 million girls will be married by the year 2030. Um, there is research to suggest that child marriage increases the risk of a number of diseases and conditions. Um, these include, but are not limited to, cervical cancer, maternal and neonatal mortality, malaria, depression and social isolation, and intimate partner violence. And now to talk about autonomy, child marriage, and conflict settings altogether a little bit, um, research has shown that these are intertwined. So for example, seven out of 10 countries with the highest rates of child marriage were considered fragile states in 2017. And in addition, many of the driving factors of child marriage in non-conflict settings are just exacerbated during times of crisis. So this includes, you know, families, parents feeling like they have to protect their girls from real or perceived threats of violence, um, economic instability, a lot of times during conflicts, access to education becomes very limited for girls. So parents feel like they have no other choice. Um, and then in addition, lack of global support around this issue because of the competing priorities um, in an active conflict. And of course, we can't talk about this issue unless we contextualize Yemen specifically. So briefly in 2014, um, a civil war broke out. And um, since then, this has been deemed the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. Um, in 2021 alone, 80% of the population was in need of some sort of humanitarian protection or aid, and they were at risk of hunger and disease. And 2023 marks the ninth year of this conflict in the poorest region in the Middle East, or the poorest country in the Middle East. Um, this crisis has compounded challenges to an existing fragile education system, water system, um, water and sanitation system, and healthcare system. So why study autonomy specifically? Um, autonomy has been closely tied to overall health and well-being, but there's been relatively little research um, tying it to child marriage somehow. In addition, I also wanted to move beyond stereotypes and monolithic representations of child marriage. So there's been little research um, on why girls might even want to get married before the age of 18 and how they might actually be using their agency to pursue a better quality of life by getting married earlier. Um, and finally, I wanted to center girls' experiences and understandings of their own lives. 
the global community has been criticized in the past for viewing girls as passive victims instead of active and independent agents of their own lives. And I wanted to at least attempt to address that in this analysis. So that leads me to the research gap. Um, research has shown the effects of a lack of autonomy after child marriage, but there's been very, very little research on factors um, related to autonomy before the marriage actually occurs. And thus, my research question became, what factors are associated with decision making for adolescent girls at the time of first marriage? So now to step into methods a little bit. <clears throat> the study was conducted in the densely populate, populated regions of Aden, Hadramut, and Mareb. And we had like an equal number of internally displaced persons and host communities that we interviewed. And then my analysis came from um, a household survey um, and that was answered by an adult female and another survey on child marriage and childbearing that was answered by two married or unmarried adolescent girls. And so these are my variables here. Child marriage was a binary variable. So in other words, it was just coded as was a girl married um, as a child or not. And then my dependent variable was decision making. And it was derived from the following question. Girls were asked, how much were you involved in the decision to get married the first time? Very much, not very much, or not at all. And then I turned this also into a binary variable. And then the other covariates that I was interested in was displacement status, level of education, economic status of the household that she grew up in, birth order. So what number of a, of a, a daughter she was. So was she the first girl? Was she the last girl? And then number of siblings, so brothers and sisters total. Okay, and now just um, for my analytical sample, I had 991 girls in the analysis after I accounted for missingness. And of course, I took out any girl that wasn't married. And so just um, some statistical jargon here, I did at first a descriptive analysis, then I checked for assumptions. Um, and then I finally ended up with unadjusted and adjusted binary logistic regression. I used that to estimate an odds ratios and 95% um, confidence intervals. And now for the results. So these are just demographic characteristics of the girls. Um, as you can see, there's, there's a few numbers that I wanna point out. The first one is that um, most respondents were actually child brides. So 55% of these 991 girls were married between the ages of 10 and 17 years old. And in addition, um, most of the study respondents were displaced as well. Um, now, to look at child marriage and decision making specifically, I also want to point out a few numbers here. So first, we see that 71% of girls actually said that they were involved in the decision to get married, um, while only 29% said that they were not involved. And then, but when we separate the responses by if a girl was a child bride or not, we see that there's a clear relationship here. So about one third of girls that were married before the age of 18 said that they were not involved in the decision to get married, while only 22% of girls married um, at or above the age of 18 said that they were not involved. Um, when looking at unadjusted rates, there's an association between child marriage and decision making, as well as displacement status and decision making, and this is significant at the um, uh, 0.05 level. And so this association also holds up after controlling for all other factors. So what does this mean? What's the, what's the bottom line here? The bottom line is that holding all other covariates constant, child brides were 88% more likely to say that they had little or no involvement in the decision to get married the first time. And displaced girls were 38% more likely to say that they had little or no involvement at all in the decision to get married the first time. Um, so in other words, this means that all the other variables that I was mentioning earlier, birth order, years of education, economic status, they don't have a significant impact on decision making, but being a child bride and being displaced does. So now to go into the, the implications for this, um, of course, we see that a high number of young women um, were involved in the decision to get married. And this is actually inconsistent with the current global narrative, although there needs to be more research done. There needs to be a clearer understanding on how girls are using their agency, what potential benefits they might see in an earlier marriage, and how they view their parental roles, their, their family's role, and societal roles in making this decision, and really to parse out coercion itself. 
Um, and then in addition, decision making was significantly lower for girls under the age of 18 and for displaced girls. So the higher rates for displaced girls show that there is a need to prioritize these types of marriages for conflict settings, which, I, as I mentioned earlier, governments are currently not doing. Um, but this analysis has shown that failing to address these, this leads to serious short and long term consequences in the health and well being of girls. And so by understanding what factors are associated with autonomy before the marriage occurs, we become closer to ensuring that every girl has a right to a decision that is fully consensual and completely autonomous and further ensuring girls are empowered after they get married too. So research has shown that if a girl is able to choose her husband, she is more likely to negotiate with him and other household members in important decisions in her married life. And in addition, decision-making and autonomy are really tied to better reproductive health outcomes, um, such as contraceptive use, prenatal care, and antenatal care. And now to really go into strengths and limitations, I actually really wanna focus on the limitations of, of this study. So first decision-making was only ascertained with one question. Um, so it's difficult to see, to understand how girls really understood this question, especially for the young girls aged 15 to 17 years old. And then because this is so context specific and the conflict in Yemen is ongoing, this is really difficult to generalize to other conflicts. And you know, my study was a quantitative analysis, but there needs to be a qualitative component to really parse out what the girls are feeling and saying. Okay, thank you so much for um, for being here. Um, I have a few acknowledgements. First, of course, Dr. Zimmerman for bearing with me and uh, for always responding to my STATA issues, which seemed ongoing, and um, the entire team. And um, you know, they say it takes a family to raise a child, but I think it takes a family to write a thesis. And so I certainly have, I mean, a village. Um, I certainly have a village here supporting me today. So thank you so much to everyone that um, that made it out today. Great job, Huda. Thanks. <laughs> Cracking us up. Um, all right. Okay. I see several questions um, have come in. Um, I guess we'll take students first. Uh, wow, so many questions. Um, great. So, um, Khadija, do you want to start and then we'll uh, hand it over to Mo? Sure. And um, I, I think this is a really interesting research question. And I don't want to freak you out by what I'm asking. So, I'm just going to say that in advance. <laughs> Have you flipped your independent and your dependent variable temporally? It sounded like the decision-making questions were, being, were asked about the decision to get married rather than household decision-making, right? I know that there's like many surveys ask questions about decision-making between partners in the household. It sounded like your questions were about whether or not the, the adolescent made the decision to get married. And so since that comes after them, right, that comes before them actually getting married, I'm wondering why you chose child marriage as your independent variable and then that decision question as your dependent variable rather than the opposite. Does that make sense? I think I'm understanding your question. Let me know if I'm not understanding it. These, so these were married girls and they were asked about their first marriage. So I don't, temporality wasn't an issue here. Let me know if I'm not answering your question. So I think there's, I think this is a great, so this is a really great um, example of like cross-sectional studies, right? Some often the limitations with cross-sectional studies is that it's one time point. And so we think of temporality as something that we can't ascertain. But if we think about like the, there's ways that you can actually ascertain temporality. And one of those, for example, can be like recall periods. Um, of questions, but another is, you know, when, what are you asking about? And then when in the life course would have that thing occurred? And so if we're talking about the decision to get married, right? Or their first, like the, this is their first marriage. So decision to get married and then the marriage happens is my assumption is that temporally the decision for them to get married happens before the actual marriage, right? And so in that case, then the child marriage occurs afterwards. And so temporally, the involvement or that process of decision-making is occurring first. So even though it's cross-sectional data, it sounds like, to me, I think when I heard your question, I had assumed that child marriage was going to be your dependent variable and that you were ascertaining risk factors for early child marriage. Does that make sense? And so whether or not like the child is involved in decision-making could be a risk factor then for whether or not they're married early. Um, 
Yeah. That's in contrast to something like household decision making, which is, you know, do you and your partner make equal decisions about certain things? And so just if you're taking this further, if you have those questions around household decision making, I think you could actually do something there where you've got, you flip what you've got currently, but then you add that household decision making in there somewhere. You could add it as an as a antecedent, not an antecedent, but like a an additional outcome or something to see. Um, and maybe you could make there might be something you could say there about autonomy before and after marriage, but I'm yeah glad to hear what what you were thinking and and if that doesn't make sense, let me know. Okay, thanks. That's that's really helpful. I really appreciate the the suggestion. All right, sorry, I was on um, mute there. Um, thank you, thanks for that. Um, Mo, do you want to go ahead and ask a question? Sure. Hi, Huda. Congrats. A uh, very great talk. I just wanted to uh, make sure I was understanding your process around the involvement variable. When you made it bi binary, based on how you uh, presented the discussion, is it right that I'm assuming you made no involvement and little involvement, your like no involvement variable and then a lot of involvement as like, okay, I see Nadia. Okay, I just wanted to clarify yes. that piece. Yes. Do you yes. have a reasoning behind um, combining little to no rather than any versus no involvement? Yes. Um, a lot of this is, and you know, I, as a new, like a newer researcher, I discovered that a lot of things that you do are because of assumptions and models. And this was one of those, there was like very, um, I think that we had, uh, a limitation in terms of the number of girls that actually answered no involvement at all. So I had to do groupings together to get a proper, proper, like statistical analysis. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Mel. Okay, we have time for just a few more. Emily? Sure. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Huda. I also had a question about variables. And can you talk a little bit about why you chose the variables of interest and what your theory was behind choosing those specific ones? Um, Huda, I believe you're talking, but you are muted. Whoops, okay, thanks. Um, uh, I'm going back to uh, this slide so that we can look at this together. So I was interested in displacement status, of course, because this is a community that has displaced girls. Um, level of education, my assumption there was um, the more a girl is educated, she might have a little bit more um, say, in it, especially before she um, gets married. And then economic status of the household of origin, you know, the literature has shown that like poverty and economic instability is a huge factor in this. So I had assumed that if she came up, if she was born in a household that was extremely poor, that perhaps she would have less autonomy. And then birth order and number of siblings. Um, my assumption with birth order in terms of like the number of girls in a family was that maybe, um, you know, the first couple of girls have less autonomy, but then the the younger girls or the girls bor born later on would have more autonomy. And same thing with number of siblings. Like I assume that maybe if a family had lots of siblings, then um, the first couple of girls um, would have less autonomy. And then as they went on, um, they would have more autonomy. I, I spoke to somebody from um, our Yemen team and she actually, she mentioned that um, I could just do sisters um, in general. Um, look at sisters specifically. And then I also wanted to do certain things that I couldn't do um, because of assumptions and, and, and statistical analysis. I wanted to look at if they knew their husband before they got married, did that make a difference um, in, in their level of autonomy? But yeah, that's that was kind of my thinking. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great, Anne. We'll just have these last two questions before we wrap up. Go ahead, Anne. Sure, uh, what a great job on your presentation. Uh, given that you mentioned so much that this of like of this is contextual, could you talk about any previous studies and what they've shown about the topic? I would be interested in that like decision making. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that question. So I'll start by saying that these studies are actually very. There's actually very few of them because we're looking at all three of these factors together, and they're qualitative. Um, um, and, and very contextual, like we said. Um, but what we've seen in the literature is that parents and girls are often saying different things. So it's a very complicated kind of story. Um, families of girls often say that, you know, they're given a choice to refuse their suitors um, and really assert their preferences. But when girls are asked, they say that um, there is, they have more coercion, there's more nudging involved. Um, 
And yet at the end, there's few girls that believe that they actually were in a forced marriage. This could be about because of like misinformation about how prevalence, uh, how prevalent child marriage is. So they might think that like, oh, like everyone's doing this. So this is just something that we have to do. Um, yeah. So it really just shows that there is there's certain nudging or coercion that's happening with parents, although whether or not parents, communities and families want to believe that that's what that is, um, is, is another story. But yeah, and so oh, one last thing, there was um, a lot of par parental accounts of just being anxious in terms of finding a suitor. Um, and um, parents did say that girls had the right to like deny anybody that they didn't want to get married to, but there was an anxiety within families of not being able to get married. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for asking. Great, we have time for one last question. Um, go ahead, Michelle. Okay, great, thank you so much. I was just messaging Celia to say, if we're out of time, it's okay. Um, but Huda, I just wanted to say congrats. This is such an important topic. And um, I wondered if you, I thought it was really interesting that even for the non under 18s, you know, which is likely to be a wide age range in terms of age, but I just thought that the the autonomy levels were also not optimal for those that are married over 18 and I wanted to know if you had any reflections on that or comments about whether their experiences may be different, um, some of the elements that you were just discussing about sort of nudging and coercion and things like that. Um, but I just wanted to, to hear if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah, I completely agree with you. So as I mentioned about one, it was about 22% that were married over the age of 18. So you're right in saying that that's not a great number either. Um, yeah, that's not, that's not a great number. Um, but um, I think what worries me specifically about the child marriage piece is um, I'm, I'm thinking about just family roles in general. Um, and I'm thinking about, you know, younger girls not being able to parse out their own autonomy, as you know. And then also in terms of policy, I feel like this really makes a difference because there are certain organizations, as, as, as you and I know, that really just want to stamp out child marriage. And of course, in order to to make a categorization, they 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 cut that off at 18 years old. I, however, you know, like I still, you know, there's well evidence to show that when you're over 18 years old, there is still a possibility of being coerced, especially if you're still living in a household, if you don't have um, proper education, a job, right? These all factors are contributors to child marriage. I mean, to a coerced marriage. Um, so 100%, this is a type of issue, as you know, that there's a bunch of different lens that you can look at it. And um, unfortunately, they're all kind of, um, they all can be concerning. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for asking. Great. Thank you. And thanks everyone for all of the excellent questions. Well done, Huda. Um, all right. We have our last but not least, our final presenter, um, Emily Sanchez. Um, and Emily joined us here at Johns Hopkins um, from Cornell University, where she joined, where she earned her Bachelor of Science in global and public health sciences. Um, today, Emily will be presenting on her uh, master's essay, which uh, is entitled Child Marriage Displacement and the Perceived Impact of Family Planning on Marriage Dynamics Among Adolescent Women in Yemen. So go ahead, Emily, we can see the slides, you can take it away. Okay, great. Thank you, Celia. Um, yes, as she just said, my name is Emily, and I am presenting on child marriage displacement and the perceived impact of family planning on marriage dynamics among adolescent women in Yemen. So just to give you a little bit of context on the situation, even though Huda did a great job of explaining it, um, in Yemen, the country has been involved in a civil conflict since 2014, and then this has led to a massive humanitarian emergency. Uh, where the population is experiencing lots of health challenges. These can include uh, food insecurity, lack of access to health services, and cholera outbreaks. But as a result of the conflict and the already under-resourced setting, um, the health systems in Yemen have been weakened, and it's the women and children who are really feeling these impacts the strongest. So in 2019, for example, 55% of women ages 15 through 49 were facing unmet need of contraception and not being able to access this contraception leads to pregnancies that don't always have the best outcomes. So many women in Yemen who experience a major obstetric complication are not given the care they need. And now I'd like to focus specifically on adolescent women in Yemen. 
So there were about 4 million child brides in 2013 in Yemen, and about a fourth of them were married before they were 15 years old. And the ongoing conflict has only led to more displaced adolescents, and that has increased the frequency of child marriage. And this rise in child marriage is concerning because this practice can lead to unsafe and unwanted sex, uh, STIs, pregnancy, childbirth, um, childbirth complications, I mean, and generally limited life and educational and career choices for the educational, for the, um, the adolescent girls. So with so many ways that that child marriage can be harmful to the sexual and reproductive health of the adolescents, it's really important that the young population is supported in their use of family planning. So even if the health systems in Yemen are weakened and that might limit access to their family planning, the step that kind of comes before that is if the adolescent woman feel supported and approved or even encouraged to use methods of contraception. So this leads to my research question, which is how do child marriage and displacement both shape adolescent women's views on how much support they're getting from their husbands for using family planning? So then to answer that research question, I use data from a study called the early marriage and early childbearing among conflict affected and displaced adolescents in Bangladesh and Yemen. It's a long study name. Uh, part of this study was a questionnaire that took place in three governorates of Yemen, and these were Aden, uh, Hadramut, and Marib. And then the sample that I focused on who answered that questionnaire was specifically married adolescent women aged 15 through 24, and they had about equal distributions of child marriage statuses and displacement statuses. And for my main independent variables, I was looking at child marriage and displacement. And then for the dependent variable, I was looking at the married adolescent woman's responses to three statements on that questionnaire. And you'll see that on the next slide. Um, but the potential confounders that I thought might affect the relationships that I was analyzing were parity, education, wealth, and the governor. And then the type of analysis that I was doing was a multinomial logistic regression, and all of the statistical work was done in Stata. So here are the three family planning statements that I'm gonna be focusing on from that questionnaire that I mentioned. So I selected these three specifically because they all kind of mention marriage dynamics in some way. So you see that the three are, if I use family planning, my husband may take another wife, or there will be conflict in my marriage if I use family planning, or if I use family planning, my body may experience side effects that will disrupt my relations with my husband. So the answer choices that the women were given were strongly agree, disagree, or strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, agree, and strongly agree. So for the sake of the analysis, I didn't include any of the responses where the women selected uh, that they had a neutral response or that they refused to respond or they said they didn't know because those numbers in those categories were too small. So then these are the first logistic regressions that I run and it had child marriage and displacement included in the model as separate independent variables. So then for all of the regressions, the reference category was uh, the woman saying that they strongly disagreed with the family planning statements. So then on the slide, you see that I've circled the p-values that are statistically significant in the unadjusted analysis. And then if you look at the agree and strongly agree columns that actually have you know, circled numbers, um, you can see there's a lot of support for child brides and displaced adolescents being more likely to agree with these statements. So they're more likely to say, you know what, yes, um, my husband probably would take another wife or there would be conflict in my marriage or I am afraid of the side effects if I use family planning. So then this is the adjusted analysis uh, where I finally included all of the confounders that you can see on the left. So then this one is just for the additional wife statement. Um, and I have circled the p-values that have changed in significance from the last slide, so from the unadjusted analysis. And you see that now child brides aren't more likely to strongly agree with the fact that their husbands would probably take another wife if they started using family planning. And then this is another adjusted analysis. We see that now child brides aren't more likely to strongly agree with the fact that there would be conflict in their marriage if they used family planning. And also displaced adolescents aren't more likely to strongly agree anymore. 
And then this is the third adjusted regression with the disruptive side effect statement. So um, we see that displaced adolescents now aren't more likely to agree with the statement about side effects disrupting their marital relations. Um, and then I know I kind of flew through these charts, but basically we saw that a lot of the child marriage relationships that started out significant in the unadjusted analysis are not significant anymore, but the displacement ones pretty much remain significant throughout, even with the addition of confounders. So then here I have some major findings based on the results that I just presented. So the fact that being displaced and removed from your home and forced to relocate is so intertwined with thinking things will go wrong in your marriage if you use family planning uh, is kind of understandable if we look at the published literature on displacement. So multiple studies that have been done in conflict-ridden countries have shown that um, being displaced increases a woman's risk of experiencing intimate partner violence and sexual violence. So a woman with trauma and less power and less agency as a result of being displaced and who also has a husband who doesn't treat her well, it makes sense that she would be hesitant to you know, suggest to her husband that she start using family planning because she's kind of expecting that backlash. And then there are also other aspects of displaced couples that we need to keep in mind. Um, like it's possible that with all of the stress and anxiety and tense relations that come with being displaced, these adolescent women don't want something else added on. They don't want to also worry about painful or uncomfortable side effects from the family planning methods um, that limit their sexual activity. So another reason could be that people who have been displaced may think it's unethical to use family planning and further limit the population size when they're in the middle of a conflict where you know people who they know and are, are their peers are dying all around them. And so if the husband and wife disagree on this argument, then maybe that could be a reason for conflict. And then one surprising finding from this was that being a child bride was not really connected to how supported the adolescent woman felt in their use of family planning. Uh, this could be because of the factors that were included as confounders, like education and wealth. Maybe those are also impacting the type of life situation that a woman is in and the relationship that she has with her husband. So child brides are more likely to be in poor financial situations and have limited education. But if you just compare them to other women who are just as poor or have just as limited life and career opportunities, then maybe both groups would be just as likely to end up reliant on their husbands and with decreased autonomy and want to avoid conflict. Um, so being in a relationship like this probably wouldn't make an adolescent woman feel very supported in her use of family planning. And finally, I just wanted to point out that the statements about um, the husband taking another wife and about there being conflict in the marriage, it seems to be measuring a different thing than the statement about disruptive side effects, um, because the additional wife and the conflict statements, those were really touching on power dynamics and autonomy levels between the husband and the wife. Um, but the disruptive side effects statement, it wasn't entirely measuring just that. Like you could think that there are other reasons why um, a woman wouldn't want to experience side effects from contraception, like the financial costs of treating the side effects or the potential loss of social status from bleeding irregularly. So women of any age, not just child brides, could hold these beliefs. There were some limitations to the study. So it only included married women because it wasn't culturally appropriate to ask unmarried women these questions about family planning. And then it also wasn't a representative sample of adolescents because um, displaced adolescents were oversampled. And in terms of where this research can go in the future, um, it could be beneficial to start exploring why displacement has such an impact on family planning and if this holds up across a wider range of ages, so not just adolescents. And then it could be also interesting to see if there's a stronger connection between being a child bride and holding certain family planning attitudes in other humanitarian settings, since we didn't find a very strong connection in Yemen. And then these are just my acknowledgments. I'd like to thank Dr. Linnea Zimmerman for uh, being my reader on the essay and being a mentor throughout the whole process. And I wanna thank the whole study team who collected this data that I have the opportunity to present to you all today. And finally, my family, friends, and partner for being a support along the way. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful presentation, Emily. Thank you so much. Yeah. I see you already have two questions. Um, Monica, do you wanna kiss yeah. off?
Yeah, first, um, before I ask my question, I just want to say great job, Emily. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, and I thought it was really nice to look at also. Um, and at the end, you mentioned how one of your limitations was that you could only include married women, um, like for cultural reasons. And I'm just curious, like, do you have any ideas about what unmarried women might be thinking when it comes to using family planning in this situation? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, it was unfortunate that only the perspectives of married women were captured. Um, I imagine that unmarried women are still living in that same kind of society where, you know, there's a pressure to have children, um, but they also are facing the same resource barriers. Like the I mentioned, the health systems are weakened, so they have that limited access to family planning. I guess it's true that they don't have maybe a husband that they would have to consult before they start using family planning. But if they have any partner in any way, I think those patriarchal um, patriarchal like relations would still be the same. Like there would still be power dynamics between that woman and whoever she's with. Um, who and that might really shape whether she feels comfortable or able even to go out and get methods of contraception. Great, thank you. Fauzia? Yes, great presentation, Emily. It was really interesting and wonderful. I was just wondering, like, um, given the conflict and war situation in Yemen and the weak health systems, how accessible the family planning services are for adolescents in Yemen? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, I feel like it has never been particularly easy for adolescents to access contraception in the first place, even outside of conflict and war, um, because they just don't have as much freedom and ability to go out to these clinics. You know, they can't just wander around and get something like maybe they have other people they want to consult. Um, but yes, especially in the context of Yemen and the ongoing conflict. Um, I can imagine it is very difficult for the adolescents to get to these services. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Do we have any other questions for? Oh, I see there's one question. Huda, did you want to come off um, mute and ask your question? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much, Emily, for the presentation. Um, the question that I asked in the chat was. Um, do you have any um, policy or program implement implications um, um, for the research that you're doing? So just wondering if you if you thought about that. Um, I thought of a little bit about it, not in terms of policy. I'm less familiar with policies, but in terms of programs, I was thinking it'd be kind of interesting now that we know adolescent women don't feel as supported by their husbands to use family planning, like compared to people who aren't displaced. Um, maybe if we can identify who these displaced couples are, you know, either the woman is displaced or like the woman and her husband are displaced. Um, if we can identify who those people are and maybe target them within an intervention to try in some way to increase the decision-making power and like the autonomy of the woman. And maybe I think it would be helpful if there was a component that worked with the couple to just increase communication skills um, and really build up that relationship so that the woman feels comfortable bringing up the topic of family planning with her husband in the first place. Great, thank you so much, Emily. And um, a big round of applause for all of our presenters today. Um, this was a great first day to kick off the master's essay presentations. Um, and you all did such a phenomenal job, so thank you. Um, thanks to everyone who attended today's session. Um, the session will be recorded in case you want to revisit any of the content. Um, but we look forward to having the next group of presenters next week. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>